ADASM. Using a request class can easily help us to validate incoming requests. But sometimes we need something that's more customizable. And Laravel has an answer to this, and it is called the validator. Let's try to replace our post store request with a validator, and you'll see how it works. All right, first thing first, we'll need to create a validator instance. And to do that, we can call in the validator facade, and we'll call the make method to make an instance of the validator. The first argument is the data that we want to validate, which in our case here will be the request body. And we can retrieve that request body by using the request only method, which is similar to what we have passed in to the correct method for our repository. And now notice that we're kind of repeating ourselves here. So it might be a good idea to create a variable called payload, which will be our request body and pass on payload to the make method and the repository correct method. Now the second argument accepted by the make method is an array of rules. The syntax of this rules array is similar to what we have used in our request class. Let's copy and paste it to here. The third argument is a way for us to customize the error message. Again, we can simply copy and paste it from our request class. The fourth argument is a way for us to customize the attribute name for the attribute placeholder. By the attribute placeholder, I mean the column attribute placeholder that we put in the error string in a validation rule, just like our integer array custom rule here. Okay, now back to our controller. In the fourth argument of the make function, we can customize what to show in the attribute placeholder. So I'll map user IDs to user ID, and that's what we're gonna see later in the error message. And that's pretty much how we can set up a validator. Now to get our validator to validate our request, we simply need to call the validate method on it. The validate method will validate the user input based on the rules that we supplied, which is similar to what we have done in the request class. If the validation failed, then Laravel will send out an error response back to the client. Okay, now let's test our code. First of all, let's remove our request class injection and replace it with the base request class. And now to test our code, let's go to Postman and send a request to the post store endpoint. And in the response body, we see our customized error message, which means we're using our custom validator instance rather than the request class. And you can also see that we're using our custom attribute name for the user ID's error message. Great. And that's how we can use the validator to validate data. Now, although the validator provides more flexibility than the request class, but it can really pollute our controller method a lot. Setting a validator up can take up a lot of lines of code. So which one should we use? It's really up to you. It's a personal preference and you can pick whichever suits you the best. I tend to use the request class as far as I can because it is nice and clean and it's easier to manage. Okay, now let's move on. The validator instance provides us a lot of helper functions to work with the validation. It is very flexible and powerful. Let's take a look at a few of those helper functions. First of all, we got the errors method. The errors method will return us all of the validation error as an instance of the message back class. The message back class provides us a nice interface for us to work with the data in it. As you can see in the autocomplete drop down here, you can easily convert the data into JSON or an array by calling the right method. That is, whenever you need the error message in a different format. Let's dump the error and go to Postman and see what it looks like. And in the response, we see the message back contains the error message of the validation. Great. The errors method also has an alias called messages. So it's up to you which one to use. So if you go to Postman, hit the send button again, and we still get the same dump response. The fails method determines whether the validation has failed or not, and it returns a boolean. Let's go back to Postman to test it out. And we see true in a response because our validation has failed. The passes method is the inverse of fails, and back in Postman, we see false. The attributes function will retrieve the payload that we pass into the validator, and it has an alias called getData. And back in Postman, we see two identical dumps in the response. The failed method will get all the failed validation rules, but it only works after the data is validated. Functions like fails and errors will trigger the validation behind the scenes. So if we comment out the errors method and messages method, we would expect to see an empty array. Let's go to Postman, send another request, 
and we did see an empty array in the response. Now if we uncomment the messages method back in Postman, we now see an array of the validation rules. We can call the addRules method to dynamically add rules to our validator. For example, if I want to add a new rule to a hypothetical field called Heya, I can simply pass an array to the addRules method and set the rule just like before. This is great for conditional validation, but I do not encourage this in general because it is hard to maintain and debug. We can also add an after validation hook to the validator by using the after method. So the function that we pass into the after method will be triggered whenever the data is validated. The function accepts the validator instance as its argument. And I'm going to simply dump a random string just for demonstration. And now back in Postman, we'll send a request again. And we see hey yeah yeah in the response, which was triggered by the messages method call here. Okay, last thing before we end the lesson. The validator instance also allow us to call each validation rule as a function. For example, I can call the validate string method to test whether a value is a string or not. The first argument is the attribute name, which we can set it to anything we want. And the second argument is the value that we want to test. So here we are testing whether the number 1 to 3 is a string or not. And we expect this function to be false. Let's go to Postman and we see false in the response. To see a list of all the available validate methods, feel free to check out the Laravel API documentation. The link is in the description if you're interested. Now you might be wondering why does not autocomplete for the validate string method even though it is a valid method. And the reason is because the make method from the validate facade is type hinted to return us the validator contract, which does not cover the full method list in an actual validator instance. Now to solve this issue, you can install a package called IDE Helper, which will provide all the auto-completion support for your IDE. Again, the link is in the description if you want to check it out. All right, I think it's a good point to stop here. Again, validator is a flexible alternative to the request class. It is up to your personal preference on which one to use. We need to validate the other endpoints as well. I'll leave that as an exercise for you. Key takeaway for this lesson, Validator is an alternative way to validate input data other than using the request class. Validator has the benefit of providing us a lot of helper functions to work with validation. That's it for this lesson and I'll see you again in the next video. If you enjoyed the content of this video, don't forget to hit the like, subscribe and the bell icon for more content to come. It will really help me out. Thanks for your support.